apparently the microphone up here is not working. So there's going to be two requirements. I have to project my voice just like I was in uh, – in a musical or something. And you got to hush, zip, zap, so that I don't have to talk over you, okay? So if I have to come, if I have to talk over you, I might have to uh, start really projecting. And then that would be a big problem. Anyway, uh, we're going to do uh, an example here. You can see on the outline for today, uh, as I promised, um, an example of how to calculate your clicker points. And specifically, um, how to calculate your clicker points if your clicker participation is below 85%. All right. So some of you have got all the clicker uh, questions uh, answered so far this semester, which is nice. Then just ding 25 uh, for for your for your point for your grade points. Uh, but if you're below 85%, we got to use a proportion. And we're going to go through that procedure this morning, or this afternoon. Uh, also, we're going to get back to the idea of impulse and momentum that Sir Isaac Newton talked about. Also, collisions, which, you know, like a collision between, uh, you know, two billiard balls or two uh, steel ball bearings or something like that. Uh, that's a that's like you can model that similar to the uh, the two skateboarders. Uh, Caitlin and uh, and Joyce. So uh, and then uh, if we have time, we'll talk. We'll start talking a little bit about uh, Albert Einstein's uh, theory of space time, four dimensions in space time. And I think we'll have a short homework number five, and we'll save a little bit for next weekend. Uh, here's the SI schedule. Uh, next one is on Wednesday, three o'clock, and then four thirty o'clock. Uh, over in the BA building. Uh, now, uh, attention, all points bulletin for all students in the sound of my voice. We have new office hours, and I mean serious office hours. Where's the ass? Where did she go? Oh. Oh. Now we have SI with Yaz, but now. We also have office hours with Anna, our TA. There's a picture of her. She's sitting right up here in front. And Professor Galileo says, okay, you can't come to office hours with me. That's all right. Just go to Anna's. Now, she has uh, 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, on Friday. Ooh, I forgot to put it. So just pencil that in mentally uh, that her office hours are Friday morning. And they're in the, the first floor of the PSP, the Physical Sciences Building. So what you do is you go to the Physical Sciences Building, which is like right next door to the uh, uh, Counseling Center. It's right by the uh, – what's the name of that place over there, The um, that dorm? Libra. Libra. Okay. And there's a shuttle bus stop there, so that's where – you know, right by Libra and stuff. That's where the physical science is building. So you go in through the main entrance, and then you turn left, and you go past my office. I won't be there on Friday, but she will. At the end of that corridor, turn, go in the main entrance and turn left, go all the way down. It's a little cornered nook uh, uh, almost to the end uh, where she'll be. There will be four or five chairs, and you can sit around. There's a marker board, kind of like uh, the office hours area where I work uh, in office hours. And uh, it accepts a little smaller, and it's but it's very nice. And students, and you know, if you want to see something interesting, she'll be in there, kicking students out of there on fr Friday. And I want to see. I, I wish I could be there to see Anna in her bouncer mode. Uh, but it's a little study nook. It's very nice. And uh, go there on Fridays. If you can't make mine uh, from 10 to 11. On uh, Mondays, maybe you can make some some of these hours, 9 to 11, on Fridays. All right? So any questions about that? OK. 
Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we want to start taking notes now. Uh, we want to do a grading example based on some data that's in our web courses area right now. So, and we're going to do an example and, uh, and do some calculations with it. So right now in your grades page, it looks like this. Um, and this is uh, up towards the top. Uh, I put a new category in uh, to sort things uh, like miscellaneous uh, summary data towards the top. So here's what it looks like. Let me blow it up a little bit. All right. And uh, up on top, you'll see, let me turn around here. Ah. Up on top. Uh, there's two numbers here, clicking correct as of uh, yesterday and clicking answered as of yesterday. Now, those are the two things that record your participation in class. So this particular uh, John Q student here, aha, thank you. Let's see if this works. Psychology so department, can you hear me? Yes. Stop messing with the mics. All right, let me, can you, pop, can you bring this down a little bit? It's a little hot. The, the volume, I don't know quite this much. Can I turn on the volume? Yeah, it's over there. There's a, okay, keep going. Go, go, go. Less, less, less. Bring it down. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. All right, bring it up just a little bit. Okay, good. All right, let me get this. Okay, now we're back to back in business. Uh, so your class participate participation grade is based on the second number here. All right, this one. How many you've answered? Now, right now we've had 19 questions since January 21st, the first day of clicking, official clicking. All right. And for this student, this imaginary student. He has answered 14 of the 22, all right? Uh, and he's, and the, the line above that is how many you've answered correctly. Now, I'll keep a track of that as well. That's not a, a, a part of your classwork participation grade. However, that's going to be some bonus points at the end of the semester. Now, let me explain how that works. If you answer... 75% of the questions correctly, you'll get four bonus points at the end of the semester. So that's four nice bonus points. Think of it, uh, four more points on an exam, and that's what it's like. Okay, That's if you get 75% of all the clicker questions that I asked between now and the end of April uh, correct. You know, So that might be, if we have 100 questions, that might be 75 questions. Okay, If you get that many correct, you're good. All right now, the participation grade that doesn't that doesn't uh, count or that doesn't depend on how many you get correct. That just uh, depends on how many you answer. Okay, and that is, the rule for that is if you get 85% or more answered, ding, automatically 25 points. If you're below 70 or if you're below 85% participation, then we have to calculate your grade and this particular student is below 85%. So I'll show you how to calculate that. And when we do that, and in, in this example, I've already done that uh, for this imaginary student. Uh, he gets 22 out of 25 uh, class participation points. Now, another thing that we've got here is homework. Uh, so over here, this line here, homework scores. That's how many, what your grade is, uh, your score, that's the sum of all your scores on homework. Now, we haven't had a whole lot of homework yet, but we're going to have a ton, right? And so for this guy, it's uh, 17 out of 39. We've got 39 questions in homework, and this imaginary student got 17. Now, homework is just a straight percentage, all right? So that means if you get 80%, uh, the homework correct, you get 80% of 25 points. All right, now this guy's way below. Um, he's way below 50 points, so he only gets uh, 11 out of 25. 
And one more thing I want to point out to you. It, on this part of the grades page, if you see the word pointage, P-O-I-N-T-A-G-E, that signifies the number of points that you get in your semester grade as of whenever I calculate it. So this one is current as to um, February 10th yesterday. So that means, so the, the points that we can get, the regular points that we can get for a grade are 25 points for homework, 25 points for participation, 50 and 50 from your best two midterms. Okay, so that's 150. And then 100 points from the final exam. Now, that doesn't include any bonus points. And some of you have already gotten a few of those from early iClicker registration. So normally I don't factor those in until the end of the semester, you know, because they they come and you know they don't have a regular schedule for bonus point activity. Uh, but for bonus point activity, so your exams you just add the score in. Final you just add the score in. But homework you have to convert to homework pointage. Clickers you have to convert to clicker pointage as well. And then finally down here at the bottom is your total pointage as of February 10th yesterday. So what that is, is any bonus points that you have, plus the homework pointage that you've got, which you can see on your grades page, plus your iClicker, uh, your clicking uh, pointage, plus uh, one midterm, all right? So that works out to uh, uh, 100, that's right, that works out to 100 points. 25 for homework, 25 for clicking, 50 for exam one. Now, eventually, we're going to have another midterm on there. And so the pointage will be something out of 150. Right now, it's something out of 100. All right? And this student has a 78 out of 100 for his total pointage. Now, it doesn't show the, um, the exam score on this shot. But you can see it on yours and, and you know, figure out, double check your point and stuff. So at the end of the semester, this, this line here, it's kind of in the middle now, the uh, total pointage as of 210, I'll replace that with um, probably after the second exam with a total pointage by which you can look up your grade, right? Now at the bottom of the page, you may have noticed you can't see any of those gray, grade in lines that say your averages for tests and homework and all that stuff. I've deliberately turned those off, and I, I never turn them on. Uh, and But what I do turn, it, turn on is a grade scale uh, after the second exam that's based on 150. And after the final, I'll, turn, I'll use a different grade scale, the one that's in the syllabus that's based on 250. All right? But I never publish those averages down at the bottom of the grades page because web courses cannot handle our grade scheme. Web courses is just, it's frustrating to get it to do what I want. And a lot of times I can't. So I just turn off a bunch of stuff. Question? Yeah, so if I was going to give uh, a letter grade right now for the semester, I mean, it's a big if. I wouldn't be, I mean, if I were, I'd be going by that. So so this guy would have a 78%, and that's um, a, that's a B. All right? And even though, and... You know, if you think about it, his, his, his homework pointage is so low. Very few of you will be down there. Most of you will have 25, 24, 23 points out of 25 for homework and for clicking. Is most of you guys are here every day. And you have four attempts on each homework at least. Uh, so it's, it's easy to get 25 and 25 on homework and clicking or 25 and 23 on homework and clicking. Most of you will be up in that area, 47, 48, 49, 50, for this, you know, between those two categories. So it comes out to a nice chunk of change by the end of the semester. So it, 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 the other thing is that the clicking and the homework pointage balance, it's easy to get all 50 or almost all 50, and it's the same weight as one midterm. So you may have, um, you know, you're, we're going to take your best two, midterms out of three and but if one of those is still a little stinky this thing is these points are going to balance that out nicely 
if you're doing your homework faithfully and coming to class faithfully and clicking and stuff. All right. So um, I'm going to show you an example of how to do this in just a minute, but let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Now, let's work out this problem. Okay, what does this student do with 14 out of 19 clicking answers? Go ahead and write this down. And let's just go through the procedure. Okay, and I'll show you how to do it. Now, this student is below 85%, so we can't just pencil in 25 out of 25. All right, so John Q. student, participation points. So as of last Thursday, we've had 19 clicker items. And, uh, John, and in this example, John Q. student has answered 14 of them. So that's 73.68% participation rate. Uh, get your calculator out because you're going to want it. Cell phone calculator is okay for now. Uh, and just verify me, 14 divided by 19, 0 0.7368 approximately. Anybody verify me on that? Raise your hand if you verify. Okay, good. Yeah, you guys, you guys over there on the right side of the room, don't don't let me catch you napping over there. Get your calculators out and calculate with me. All right, so that's your first step. So John Q. student does that. He says, "Oh man, I'm below 85 percent." But that's not that's you know he's still okay. You know he's only got to make 85 percent. But now we have to do um, a uh, a proportion. Now he's got 12 of them correct. 12 out of 19 is not 75. Matter of fact, what is 12 out of 19? It's definitely less than 75%. It's about 60-something percent. What is it? Uh, anybody verify 63.15%? Okay. All right. So he's not – so John Q, right now, he's not in line for those four bonus points, but he still has a lot of the semester to go. So hopefully you can bring that up and, and nab those bonus points. Now – with uh, oops, that should be 14 out of seven. Oops, that should be 14 out of. Whoops. Uh, let me let me change that so it's not confusing. I think I got everything else right. Where's this? In your notes, you can change this. Uh, 14 out of 19 answers. Uh, as I said before, 73.68. He's below 85%. So he has to solve a proportion. Now, this is the proportion that he's got to solve, okay? His percentage divided by 0 0.85 equals his pointage divided by 25. Now, we could figure out, or we've already figured out, his percentage. So that goes in on the top of this left side of the proportion, right? So it's going to look like this. Now, this is correct, 73.68%, okay? So that's a, that's a proportion. And you've got three of the four things. So that fourth thing is pointage you can solve for by cross multiplying. So on this one, uh, you just have to cross multiply and get JQS pointage by itself. Now, I'm going to ask you how to do that on your next clicker question. Okay, so get your clickers out. And we're going to type in, you're going to figure out his pointage. And uh, by the way, uh, also, round up to the nearest, to the next whole number. Always round up. Even if you have, you know, 17.001, you round that up to 18. Okay, so so here we go. We're going to do his participation pointage from that, uh, from that, uh, let me get my clicker over here. Uh, so here's the question. Um, so type in is number, okay, for 14 out of 19 and 73.68%. So do your cross multiplication. And definitely, if, if you're a little rusty on your proportions, you know, talk with, with the people sitting next to you. Or if you're up here in the front row, talk to the people right next to you. If you're a little rusty, I'll give you a minute. So round up to the nearest whole number, 
and then hit the send key. Okay, I see some people typing in a number uh, about eight in the 80s. You should have a you should end up with a number between zero and 25. All right, so if you're up in the 80s or 70s, you're you know you're you're making a mistake. Although this is good, most of you are doing pretty good. So 0 0.7368 divided by 0 0.85 and cross multiply by 25. And then you'll get you'll have it. I saw that you won. One minute. Thirty seconds. <laughs> before lift off. Brad. Is Brad doing okay over there? Is he? Brad. Brad. Bradley. You doing okay? Just checking. Oh, oh, she just went. Do you want to talk about it? Are you getting a little nervous? Or? I don't know. She, your, your neighbor there seems to think it's a little. It's good. Okay, 20 seconds, starting now. I have a question. Why did you run it up? No, that's if. I, notice I have the word if there. That's an example. I know, but, but I always give you the benefit of the doubt on clicker and homework pointage. Okay, so I never, so this guy's, you know, that one, 11.204, um, that's below 11.5, right? So you would, in math class, you would round that down. But for, in my class, when I'm only when I'm doing homework or clicker pointage, I round it up. So even if you were 11.000001, it would still go up to 12. And that's just to give you guys a break. Instead of trying to round things off. And, no, round that. Yes, yeah, so don't round down. Okay, 20 seconds. All right, all right, go ahead. A request from the audience. Thirty seconds.
15 seconds. Don't forget to hit the send key. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, here we go. Um, how many points does John Q. student have? 22 out of 25. Raise your hand if you got 22. Okay. All right. All right. So, and here's what the here's what the tally looks like. Uh, Sixty-four percent of you got it right, so that's good. And look, you know, even if you didn't get it right today, don't sweat it. I'll be doing it. You know, I'll be putting it in the grade book. But if you ever want to know how your clicker pointage goes or where you are at any given moment, you can all do this uh, in just the same way that we just did it. So, all right. Now, a few lectures ago, uh, we were talking about the impulse equation. And I mentioned that uh, it's, it's, it's part of the first uh, several paragraphs of Chapter 4.1. And it's this one, F delta T, that's the net force, times the elapsed time or the interaction time, uh, is equal to M times delta V. And I mentioned that, that that quantity, M delta V, is really a change in a physical quantity called momentum, MV. Now, here's a picture of Sir Isaac Newton. And there's a page from his famous textbook, The Mathematical Principles of or the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And he wrote it in Latin, and this is an English translation. And it's the earliest one I could find, and it's actually free on the Internet. Uh, but it's tough. It's kind of tough to understand because it's like, it's almost like, you know, all the forsooth and all that stuff you see in Shakespeare, which drives me insane, but um, that's one of the reasons I don't like Shakespeare that much. But... Uh, you can still read it, and here's what he was talking about. For him, it was something called the quantity of motion. Now, we call it momentum now, uh, but in his day, uh, he, he described this quantity, he called it the quantity of motion. All right, so the, the amount of motion is, a, is, a, is proportional to how much stuff is moving, you know, how much mass, how many kilograms. Uh, so if you have double the kilograms, you have double the quantity of motion, all right? And, you know, one way to think about that is like uh, two football players. You know, sometimes a littler football player can knock down a big one if he's moving fast. If he's got a lot of speed, even if he doesn't have a lot of kilograms, he can still knock the blocks off of a bigger player, all right? And uh, so that's what so that's what, what he called it quantity of motion. Now uh, let's get to talking about the skateboarders. Now here's a here's a slice of a problem that probably we're going to have in homework either tonight or over the weekend. A couple skateboarders, and I call them Raymond and jo Gregory for red and green. And um, in the upper image. Let's go back here. Uh, so this image is. Um, uh, after a, an interval of travel time, delta T. So the mass of Raymond is 75 kilograms, and he travels at 1.05 meters uh, in a, t a delta T of 0 0.52 seconds. So how, the question is, how much momentum P does Gregory capture from the interaction? And my wonderful students, this is the impulse question, okay, impulse and interaction. F delta T, that's the impulse. Okay, and uh, sometimes you see it this way, F times T. Um, that equals the change in the momentum, the change in MV, all right? So if you get a little bit of force and a little bit of act interaction time, delta T, you're going to change the momentum of whatever you're pushing on, all right? So if we had a skateboarder up front here, either 
uh, Caitlin or, or uh, Joyce, um, and I did a, you know, patty cake with them, I could shove them in a, I could change their momentum state from a state of zero momentum to a state of, you know, 2.9 kilogram meters per second or whatever it is. Okay, so the change in momentum is equal to whatever the impulse F delta T is. All right. And it's, but in actuality, as we talked about last time, it comes from uh, unfolding of Newton's second law, F equals MA. Because remember what we did. We said F equals MA can be changed into F equals M times delta V over delta T. And then we just cross multiplied to get this one. All right. And um, the nice thing about this equation and this is something I want you to, to uh, consider and try to remember. It is sometimes the best way to calculate a stopping time. Now, on the, uh, on the exam one, we had a brain burner about a stopping time and a stopping distance and accelerations and stuff. And it was a brain burner because we weren't starting to use the impulse equation. And the impulse equation is a lot of times very, very easy to use. So let's look at an example of it. All right. So as you can see, this looks like um, a, a slice of a homework problem, a two-pointer, in fact. Uh, given a coin of mass 0 0.06, 0 0.05 kilograms sliding across a tabletop from left to right, that's, that's the picture from X1 to X2, uh, the speed is 1.7 uh, meters per second rightward at point X1. So that's over, that's over here, all right? And then it experiences a frictional force of negative or of 0 0.020 newtons leftward, all right? And it slows down to a stop over here. So V is equal to zero over here, all right? Uh, what is the stopping time for this coin? All right, so that's a typical, the, the two things that I want you to be able to do for exam two, well, I want you to do a lot of things, but two big ones are calculating stopping time, calculating stopping distance. Okay, so stopping time is, is today. So let's look at the specs. Here it is again. It's written out in bigger letters. Okay, given a coin of mass 0 0.05 kilograms, Sliding across the tabletop from left to right at initial point X1, its speed is 1.7 meters per second. So it's got a little bit of rightward momentum, right? Quantity of motion is uh, 0 0.05 kilograms times 1.7 meters per second, whatever that happens to be. And then it experiences a frictional force to the left. It slows down to a stop at position X2. What is the stopping time for this coin? Now, you know, Sir Isaac Newton wasn't going around stop, calculating stopping times for coins, uh, but for us it's a good exercise because uh, what we do want to figure out and understand is like gravitational interactions, and those are still important even in this day. Now, P1 and P2, we figure those two out, then we can figure out delta P because remember the impulse equation, F delta T equals delta P. All right, so we want to get delta P. And we know what the force is. It's 0 0.020 newtons to the left. And I just made that up to have a nice round number. There's nothing special about this. But it, if it is stopping, it does have a frictional force, or some kind of retarding force. And if it's a constant, you would write it this way. Now, what we're going to do is use uh, lowercase f for friction. That's the traditional symbol for a friction force. Um, and we're going to use a negative sign to denote leftwardness. All right, so that means in our impulse equation, we're going to put in a negative 0 0.020 newtons to represent this force and its leftwardness, okay? All right, so we'll use that, and uh, let's just get the stuff, um, let's, get, let's start putting it together. So we want to get P1 and P2, and we get delta P, and then we use that negative 0 0.020 newtons uh, on the other side of the impulse equation. And then we'll be able to figure out um, delta T, the stopping time. Okay, so the first one, 
P1, the momentum at position 1, X1, is its mass, 0 0.05 kilograms, times the initial speed, 1.7 meters per second, and it's rightward, right? So I'm going to put a plus sign for that one. So 0 0.05 times 1.7 is 0 0.085, and the units here for momentum, they don't have a fancy name like Newton's. They, you know, they, it weren't, it, kilogram meters per second, it wasn't named after anybody. It could have been, but for some reason they decided not to. Uh, so it's 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. And then P2, that's the cinchy one. That one's easy. Because uh, it stops, so the momentum is zero. All right. Now let me pause for questions. I see people using their screen, their cameras to grab the screen here. It's all going to be in YouTube as soon as I publish it. All right, now, so there's our P1 and P2. Good. Now we want to get delta P. So let's get those two data, and let's calculate delta P. Now, it's always later minus earlier. Okay, so the later momentum is zero, and the earlier momentum is 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. So we subtract that, okay? And what that means is that delta P is a negative number, all right? Negative 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second, which is easy because we're coming to a stop. But even if you don't come to a stop, you know, you just change to a different momentum state, you can still do this, all right? Still going to be fairly easy. Now, that's the right-hand side of the impulse equation. The other side is F delta T. Okay, so let's talk about that. So here's F delta T on the left. And, hey, you guys, we don't know what delta T is, but we do know what F is. Okay? And it's negative 0 0.020 newtons to sy symbolize a leftward force. Okay, so if you're moving off to the right... The only way to slow you down by friction is if the friction is to the left. Friction is always opposite the direction of motion. All right? And now, if you look at this, you can see that there's a negative sign on both sides of the impulse equation, right here and here. So you could cancel them there if you want. You know? Uh, but I think I'm going to keep those for a little bit longer. All right? So here we are again. Here's the here's the impulse. So the, the top line is the generic impulse equation. And here's the impulse equation, the next line, uh, for this particular example with a friction force of negative 0 0.020 newtons and a delta P of negative 0 0.085 kilogram meters per second. Now the ratio of those two, okay, is uh, what we're going to shoot for. So there's the impulse. And here's the plug-in step with the known values that's that are given, and you got to do a little bit of you know a little bit of calculation to get to this stage. And then the other thing that you the other way to do this is divide both sides by negative 0 0.020 newtons left and right. All right, and when you do that, uh, now you can just compute. And notice that I have negative over negative. So this is another place where you can uh, – this is another place where you can uh, cancel. Okay, so, you, don't, it's, you know, you cancel it earlier, cancel it now. Either way, it's, it's copacetic. Now you just got to calculate that number. Now, what's that uh, – who's got a value for the delta T? Anybody? Calculate that quotient. <laughs> who's got a – 4.25. What about you guys on the right? Does anybody over there verify? See that? Oh, good. We got verification. Good, 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 good. So, yeah, so 4.25. Yeah, that's the stopping time. 4.25 seconds. And, you know, if you were, you know, depending on the click, if it's a clicker question, I might ask you to, uh, 
you know, round off to the nearest tenth of a second. So that's 4.3. Uh, okay, so let's try some impulse, some more impulse equations. All right, so have your clicker ready. Or these are going to be multiple choice. And hit the refresh key. Definitely. And uh, let's do this one. The, um, the Klingon bird of prey vessel. Now read this carefully and answer carefully and be aware that you don't have to use all the numbers you might not have to use all the numbers in there okay so how much impulse does the Klingon tractor beam deliver in two seconds Okay, uh, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, uh, the answer here is 24 kilogram meters per second. It's just, it's just F times delta T. Force is 24. Or the force is uh, 12 newtons. The interaction time is two seconds, 24, and the, the unit of measurement is kilogram meter per second. All right, next question. A basketball has a mass of 0 0.800 kilograms and a speed of 22 meters per second. Now this one, how many seconds? So this is stopping time problem. So you want to figure out delta T. So 
So I'll give you a few minutes to, to think this one over. And definitely consult with your neighbors and stuff. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Uh, okay, let's see what you guys got here. Oh, my goodness. It looks like you guys are geniuses. 82% of you got that one right. Good. See, you're learning. Could you explain it real quick? Sure. I am so far. I'm so far ahead of you. I'm ready. You know, I, I anticipated your mind. So here's the here's the calculation for those of you that got tripped up on it. Uh, use your impulse formula. Okay. Uh, and uh, here's the um, momentum, uh, eight, 0 0.800 times 22, and that works out to 17.6. Uh, and so that's the amount that you've uh, lost, all right? Now, I, I put it in here, and the, the frictional force is – or what was this problem? This was this was not the jello. What was this? Basketball. Basketball. Okay, so it's not friction. Okay, so but it's stopping force, and we'll assume that it's the opposite direction of the motion. So the minus signs cancel out, like the the, the coin problem, and I don't even write them in here. So I have 11 newtons of stopping force 
over here on the uh, on the left side, and I've got my 17.6 kilogram meters per second over on the right after the negative signs have been canceled. So now you just have to divide 11 newtons into uh, 17.6 kilogram meters per second, right? And so that works out to 1.6, right? So there's your answer. All right, now that's, that's a way of modeling and interaction and studying the change in the dynamical state, the change in the momentum, All right? Another way to study and, and model an interaction is by collision, okay? So what we're going to do is work on some boxcar interactions. And if you've ever watched a freight, you know, trains forming up at a freight yard, which I, I hitchhiked a, a ride on a train uh, out in Montana once, you know, like just like a hobo. In fact, I met two hobos that were, uh, they were going, I don't know, they were going out to Washington State to pick apples or something like that. And, but I didn't like it. I got off after about 25 miles. It was too, you know, I was missing too much of the scenery there in Montana. And boy, if you're, if you're ever out there in Montana, it's a beautiful place. It was the middle of the summer. It's just beautiful. And the mountains are out there. Oh my goodness. But yeah, I did, I did, I did hit you ride on a boxcar once. So let's, let's think about this. Let's, let's think about, you have a set of four box cars, and each of them is 35,000 kilograms, all right? And let's say that one of them has an initial speed of 4.4 meters per second to the right, and that the other three, uh, the group of three, so V subscript G, uh, 0, 0.0 meters per second. In other words, they're at rest, okay? So that's what happens in a, in a freight yard. You have this long string of box cars, and you smush, you know, you put additional cars on. You just ram them in there at fairly low speed, and, uh, and they click in, and then, then they repeat the process with another box car and eventually form a big string. Okay, now the interaction forces are between the three box car set and box car number one. All right, so that's right down here. Uh, right down here between the two groups, boxcar one and then the group of, of three at rest. Now, they're going to change their velocity, okay? So the final state, uh, V nu, um, they're going to move off to the right, but it's not going to be 4.4 meters per second, all right? So how does this work? Well, uh, here's a little animation. There's V1, okay, then it smushes in and, uh, and changes its momentum. So the way that you do this is you calculate the total momentum beforehand, P subscript I, okay? So each of the boxcars is 35,000, but only one of them is moving, okay? So you have the first bit of momentum from boxcar one. 35,000 kilograms times that initial speed of 4.4 meters per second, all right? But the other three are zero because uh, they're at rest, all right? So those are the easy ones. If something's at rest, P is equal to zero. It's nice, all right? Now, that means that, you know, you do calculate this out. Uh, anybody get 154,000 kilogram meters per second? What's that? What's that momentum? Anybody verify me? 154. You got it. Oops, excuse me. Uh, over here. Anybody verify? You got it. Okay. All right. So uh, 154,000 kilogram meters per second. And guess what? Because the forces of interaction are internal to the boxcar system. In other words, boxcar one plus the group of three, and they're interacting with each other. There's no change in the total momentum. The momentum might be rearranged, but after the interaction, it also uh, has to be 
154,000, all right? And so you would say that PI is equal to PF, right? Now, PF is going to be slightly different because now your final, your final boxcar configuration is one string of four boxcars, and they're moving off to the right at some speed we haven't figured out yet, right? But we're going to figure it out. Uh, and the way that we're going to figure it out is by answering a bunch of questions on Clicker. So have your Clicker ready. Here we go. Here's another question. Why must the initial momentum state equal the final momentum state? And there's five answers there. Okay, read carefully and think. 30 seconds. Make a decision. <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. All right, let me see what you guys. Uh oh. There's. That's true, but this is also true, and. So make a note of it. Both of these concepts are equivalent. Momentum is always conserved if the forces are all internal to the system. So remember, it's F net is the net force. So that could be external forces or internal forces. But Sir Isaac Newton says those internal interaction forces are going to be the same size, just opposite directions. So bing, they... They cancel out, all right? So any kind of interaction force like this, the momentum state is conserved. And my wonderful students, this is huge. In this, you know, now, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, well, Albert Einstein wasn't going around studying boxcars and freight yards, all right? So, but he was interested in the dynamics of the universe, the Big Bang Theory. And, uh, and we're still – and quantum field theory, the same. And all that stuff is modeled on this idea of interaction and the conservation of momentum. It rules the cosmos. And Sir Isaac Newton's second law of motion, we also say – you know, the engineering department would say F equals MA rules the cosmos. But the physics department would say conservation of momentum rules the cosmos. And they're both right to think of them. In those, in those ways. Now, let's keep going. So afterwards, P subscript F, that's the final momentum, still got to be 154,000 kilogram meters per second. Nothing's changed there. I mean, it's, you know, and we're assuming that there's no friction on the rail and stuff, which is pretty good. You know, steel rails and steel wheels are pretty, pretty low friction. So we'll just call it 154,000. Uh, kilogram meters per second. Now, the reason we can say that, just to reinforce, is by conservation of momentum. That goes from PI to PF. Now, the other thing that we've got is just definition of momentum, MV. So what is that? Well, it's a, let's see, it's four of those 35,000 kilogram boxcars. So four times 35,000 is 140,000 kilograms times the new speed. Now, we don't know what the new speed is. That's what we want to get, all right? But you can see now, hopefully, that we've got every number in there except for V nu, okay? We've got, we've got 154,000 right here, and we've got 140,000 here, and so we can solve by dividing 
both sides uh, by 140,000, right? So we use the definition of momentum, P equals MV. And now we have a different mass, 140,000. That's all right. We got a big block of four boxcars. And this happens all the time. And then on the left side, we have the result of conservation of momentum. That's where we put a ditto mark uh, underneath P subscript I, basically, because we know that it's got to be the same, right? Now, we have this result. And to get V nu now, all you got to do, you, you take a stick of chewing gum and you just, you know, calculate away, right? 154,000 divided by 140,000 kilograms, all right? And notice that in this, in this quotient here, can you see anything to cancel there, top and bottom? You can cancel meters, right? Yes, nor maybe. What can you cancel? Yeah, you can, you can cancel kilograms, top and bottom. And if you do that and then do the, the actual computation, you only have meters per second left because you've canceled kilograms. And then you have 1.1. Ding. And there's your new velocity state for the four box cars. Originally, two, three of them were at rest, but now they're all moving off. And it's kind of pokey. 1.1 meters per second instead of 4 meters per 4.4 meters per second. Now, that was the initial state, but just for the one boxcar. Now, we've shared that quantity of motion between the four boxcars equally. And so the total speed now is 1.1 meters per second. All right. Now, let me pause for, calc for uh, questions. Good in the back? Uh, the very back row. Yeah. You good? No, the, 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 the woman sitting next to you. Yeah, you good? Okay, good. It looked like it. I mean, I, I saw you guys back there. You go like this and stuff. I thought, good. Good. All right, let's do a calculation. Uh, hit the refresh key on your calculator. And let me get this question going here. Now, this is going to be a numeric answer. All right, so hit the refresh key. Okay, 30, now we have a different velocity state. Same set of boxcars, but now it's a little bit faster. Boxcar one, it's coming in at 6.4 instead of 4.4. All right, so figure out the final state, V nu, for this different interaction. All right. And type in your answer the nearest 0 0.1 meters per second of speed. So if your answer is 8.36 meters per second for V nu, then you would type in 8.4 and then hit the send key. Now, it can't be 8.4 because that's faster than the initial speed. So we know this one's going to be, whatever it is, it's got to be less than 6.4. Okay. So go ahead and take a minute to work on this. Let's see what you guys are typing in. Da 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 da. Do 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 do. You guys are learning. That is what I want.
You guys got it? Yeah, you sure? It should fit a pattern. Did you see the pattern? Don't forget, you can always come up and sit in the first row or two and kibitz with the TA and the SI leader, which is always a good strategy. Okay, for those, I'll give you a tip. For those of you that have typed in 6.4, it cannot be 6.4. It's got to be something less than that. We're preserving the amount of motion, but not the amount of velocity. That doesn't get conserved. It's the momentum that gets conserved. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you got one point six. Sweet. Uh, students. You're learning. You are learning. Did you ever think that would be the case? Physics class, and here you are calculating stuff that Sir Isaac Newton wished he could do on a, on a good day. You guys, you're crushing it. What are you talking about? Okay, so let's talk about this idea of conservation of momentum. The skateboard is it's another great example of conservation of linear momentum. And, in fact, um, the total momentum, this is the formal, for, this is the form of it. Uh, the total momentum of a group of interacting objects remains the same in the absence of external forces. So that would be like um, uh, a Hummer trying to interact with a box car. Now, a Hummer, that would destroy a Hummer. Uh, a tank, okay, so an M1 Abrams tank interacting with the, with the box car string. That would me mess things up, but we don't have that. All right, so that would be an external force. So if there's no external forces, only the internal forces of interaction, that's it, okay? Now, let's talk for just a, a minute or two about four-dimensional space-time. You know, Einstein is, is famous for enunciating this view of the world 
that the world is not a three-dimensional world, but a fourth-dimensional, four-dimensional world. And the fourth dimension is time. And before, and you know, people always thought about time, you know, measured, make time measurements all the time up till then. But nobody thought of time as being like a spatial dimension. But we now know that that is the case. And that's why we call it space time, four-dimensional space time. He constructed a four-dimensional version of momentum. And this is how nature encodes symmetry and, in fact, the entire theory of relativity in terms of a momentum vector that has four components. All right. Now, we're not going to def- – we're going to look at this thing, but we're not going to calculate in four dimensions because that's, that's pretty – it's a lot of trig and it's a lot of advanced thinking. But I do want to emphasize that – his four-dimensional vector, his four-dimensional quantity, the, the first component is the energy, like the kinetic energy, or the E equals mc squared energy, the rest energy. And then the other three components of the vector are the x component of the momentum, the y component of the momentum, and the Z component of the momentum. So it's got spatial and temporal uh, in, the, in those uh, quantities. Now, uh, this is a good time to break off. We just have a couple minutes left. Let, let's stop here and keep an eye out tonight for homework five if I do it. And if I don't do it, we'll have some on the weekend. All right, you're dismissed. We'll start here uh, on Thursday. <laughs>